Paul Ogata, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Ogata. Um, as per your suggestion, I'm going to do the whole podcast from right here. Because <laughs> you, you, said, <laughs> you said it looked cool. <laughs> it does. Now, Paul, um, when I think of you, I always think of kind of the same way I feel about myself. Why isn't that guy more famous? Oh, well, I mean, what you do you... yourself a disservice because you are famous. You are <sighs> you're a legend in comedy. <sighs> you're, a, you're a modern American hero. <laughs> and I'm the guy like, who, who, what? Yeah. I think you're a modern American hero. You, uh, you're one of the most prolific joke writers. You're always turning over new material. Yeah. So, like, what is the main thing I want to know? Like, yeah, I'm just uh, uh, as a writing comedian writing workshop. Like, what's your process? What? A lot of self loathing because I don't like my old stuff. So you got to keep trying to uh, find new uh, favorites, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so I like necessity is the mother of invention. I think self loathing is the mother of creativity. Well, uh, I mean, where does this self-loathing come from? I mean, you grew up in Hawaii, for God's sake. So, what? Yeah. You know, when I was a kid. And you're Japanese. I mean, what <laughs> what, what better, like, heritage could you possibly have? The, the, uh, the you know, Kurosawa movies, the, the, the samurai, you know. Yeah. Well, that's all. Cool. Yojimbo. Uh, <laughs> What's Yojimbo? Another samurai thing. Uh. Uh, the Blind Swordsman, Zatoichi. Sure, all that's cool. But when I was a kid, uh, it was a real big baseball town uh, in Hawaii. Uh, you know, it's a very what, successful baseball town. What, with Honolulu, Little League where, champions. You grew up in Honolulu, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Pearl City outside of Honolulu, okay. but on the island of Oahu. But all the other uh, guys in my school, they were big uh, baseball players when we were kids. And I wasn't really into sports. So I kind of stayed at home and uh, listened to comedy albums. And that's really where I developed my love for comedy is listening to. And those guys that were so good at baseball, what are they doing now? They're it, cleaning pools and you're maybe. headlining in Las Vegas. <laughs> so <laughs> so why this self-hatred? Well, well, I mean, I deal with it myself. So that's why I'm like playfully teasing you about it, you know? Well, with the power of hindsight, yeah, you could. Uh... Like you go, you know, oh, Tom Rhodes, you're an American hero. And I just think, you know, oh my God, why, why haven't I found like lasting love? Why can't I sell out more comedy clubs? So... I think self hatred might be a just a natural fuel for comedians. Maybe. I think it's baked into the process, definitely. Yeah. Maybe we wouldn't do this if we didn't have that feeling. You see a lot of these uh, uh, jock type guys now getting into comedy, and I'm like, this isn't for you, bro. Yeah, this is not yours. Comedy was meant for the damaged and the ugly, not the <laughs> you know the people who won in life. You know, like I always thought you could never do comedy if you were like really, if you were really muscular. Like, if you look like you could kick the audience's ass. But now there's, you know, tons of you know, Joe Rogan and all these other kind of... Right, a lot of UFC guys. A lot of, yeah, UFC guys, you know? And they're getting into it. And I'm just sitting there like, no, man, this is... You might be good at it, but stop. <laughs> this is not for you. So how do, what is your writing process? Like, my writing I, always comes out when I have conversations with good friends. It's another reason I invited you over today. Well, you know, I'm hoping to get some material out of this. <laughs> but um, I can never, like, I mean, I try to sit down and write sometimes, but that's not where the good stuff comes from. And we're all wired differently, but I, I feel like, uh, from what you're saying, we're kind of wired the same. We're counter punchers. So you're in a conversation, and that sparks the creativity. Somebody will throw something out there, and you're like, ah, and you'll, you'll, you'll come back at it. Well, I think it's when, you know, when you're your, your most natural self, when you're with your friends. Sure. Or like, you know, your family, people you, you, you feel comfortable enough with. So like your most natural funny thoughts and lines come out in those moments. Yeah. And so in a similar way, I write, but I do it on stage. A lot of times I'll uh, have fun with the crowd and you'll uncover, you'll, you'll pan for gold and you'll feel like, oh, here's a nugget. And then you polish that and you uh, bring it back the next time. And it, now, now it's part of your act. So are you doing a lot of crowd work? I like to do crowd work. Uh, I find it's a, a good creative experience and uh, a good way to write new material. And it offers the audience something different that they they may have seen you before. Now they're seeing you again. But they're like, oh, this is now it's different than I just saw last night or even earlier in the night at the previous show. So I think that it that adds a little value, I guess, for when people buy tickets to see you. 
uh, and it's fun for me uh, to uh, <laughs> to find a, a, a golden nugget of comedy uh, out of almost pulling it out of the ether. And I, I enjoy that. To me, that's the, the most fun part of the process. Well, it's so dangerous to go to the crowd. I've been trying to be more conversational instead of just like blurting my act out at people. And, um, you know, like the, I had some people from Seattle in the front row. And, and I have some, the couple of Seattle jokes I have from a long time ago, I don't think are funny now. So I was like, oh, okay, I got nothing for you. And then these people over here were from Idaho and... I only have nice things to say. I didn't have anything to, to you know, it's, it's, um, it's a dangerous, terrifying moment when you go to the audience. It is, but that's the, the uh, unexpected, anything can happen type of moments that gives the audience the clue that this is special. When I, when I first started doing comedy, or before I started doing comedy, I lived in Hawaii, and I was in Los Angeles on, on a trip, and I stopped at the improv, and Steve Middleman, was on stage. And this, oh, this is a guy I've seen on TV. It's amazing. And I was like, middle of the week, Melrose Improv, uh, probably 20 to 30 people in the whole club. And I'm sitting in the front row and Steve Middleman is on stage, but he's not addressing the crowd. He's just doing his act straight ahead. Not even looking in the, in the eyes. Yeah, wow. And that, uh, I, that stuck with me. I was like, wow, I don't, I don't feel like that's genuine. Yeah. And I want not to knock Steve Middleman. He's very, very funny. Well, I, th I think that was a, I've said it many times before. It was a huge transformational point for me when, because the first few years I did stand up, I mean, I was a teenager. I wasn't even old enough to be in like clubs, that. you know? I like it. But I was so terrified. I would look over the audience's head. And it was a huge transformational moment when I started looking the audience in the eye and when I'm talking. And that's like real life. When you look people in the eye. Yeah. Uh, just words come out of your mouth more naturally and it's more powerful. You, you, you're you making a connection, you know? It was. Yeah, I, you know what I think, though? Uh, maybe he was preparing for a Tonight Show spot and I don't know, and you, you just want to run your set. You don't want to get sidetracked by talking to the crowd. So maybe that's what Steve was doing and I don't knock him for it. I understand that that's uh, probably what he was working on, maybe. Yeah. But to me, it... Uh, but I think in, in so many steps forward as a comedian, you watch other people and go, okay, that's not how to do it. That's, that's wrong. Okay, I'm not going to make that mistake. Like, I very often love to go to open mic nights, you know, to, to, try, to try new material, but Absolutely. also to see what not to do, you know? <laughs> like, oh, wow, okay, that's hack, that's hack, and oh, yeah, that's too filthy, and, you know, it's just kind of to be reminded of. Do uh, you find... Uh, that you go to regular open mics or do you find a more professional open mic where there's uh, uh, working comics that are working on new bits rather than beginning comics who are? Oh, no, 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 both, both, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, like if I'm in a, in a city or wherever, I mean, L.A., you have every kind of um, open mic night scenario, but when you go to the cities and you're like, you're seeing people doing it for the first time, you know? And there's a, <laughs> there's a certain <laughs> joy to that, absolutely. <laughs> But here in Vegas, I don't know if it's still going on, but Stephen Roberts used to have a, an open mic show. Oh, hold on. I oh. think it's the maid. It's Please, talk to the audience. <laughs> While Tom is away at the door getting a delivery of coffee oh, yeah. from the maid. I was like, okay, you don't have a Are we? Maybe you want service. <laughs> uh, in maybe in a little bit. Are you going to be here for a little while? <laughs> uh, until uh, 4.30, sir, we go down. It's, right it's live TV. Oh, and then As you're finished. To say, Today's your last day? On live TV. Uh, no, when people used to watch TV. No, oh, oh, that's how it works. Now. Okay. It's live hotel uh, room, you Maybe guys. in an hour. Are you going to be you on the floor? You can hear the sirens. Yes. You know okay. we're in Vegas. Um, I think I'll be done talking to my friend in like an hour. Okay. This is okay. Super. Thank you so much. Okay. At the soon-to-be-imploded Tropicana Hotel and Resort in beautiful Paradise, Las Vegas. Thanks for covering the... Oh, sure. Yeah, I made a lot of... You know, this is the... The end of the Tropicana. So yeah. there's a lot of great stories here. Like the maid, um, she's from the Philippines. And working here, she was able to bring her mother over from the Philippines. Oh, cool. And then her mother worked here. And then they brought over two of um, the other children the mom had, all from here. And then there was a guy at the show the other night, and he said that uh, his... His um, his grandmother had come over from Germany 
and got a job here and worked here and then was able to bring. So the Tropicana in Vegas has helped a lot of families immigrate yeah. to the United States. So This is the green card <laughs> epicenter of the United States. So what were you saying while I was gone about the oh, ma magic of Las Vegas? Stephen Roberts uh, has a show or used to have a show called The Stool. And it was a new material night for <coughs> professional comics who were working in town that week. So uh, it used to be at the Stratosphere at the L.A. Comedy Club. And then he moved it to uh, down the road on Sahara. I'm not sure if it's still there. But yeah. And that was fun because the audience was trained to expect... Uh, comics working on material, uh, professional comics working on better material than, you know, you said you'd go to these places, like, oh, that's not a good joke to do. That's yeah. that. Uh, and it was fun uh, because you didn't have to deal with all the tertiary nonsense. It allowed greater creativity. That's cool. In London, uh, there's a great open mic night. I think it still exists. I'm not sure. But the name of the open mic is Old Rope. So... From the ceiling, but on on the you know middle of the stage area, is it was a hanging rope. So the premise is the comedian goes out and is working on new material, but if they do an old joke from the past, they have to hold the old rope while they say the old material, which I think is really metaphorically beautiful. That you're like. You, you know, you're hanging on to this life preserver, yeah. you know, for safety or whatever. Uh, brilliant concept. I don't know if it still exists. I like that. Yeah. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. What, uh, what new material have you been working on lately? Uh, well, over the last several months, I've been working on uh, Royal Caribbean brought me on to launch their new ship, the Icon of the Seas, biggest ship in the world. They built a comedy club there, a comedy club in their beautiful room, uh, and so a lot of the the jokes I've been writing have been uh, germane to that experience, ship related. Yeah, uh, which is why I'm glad that now I'm getting away from that. Coming back, look here at this way. luxurious boat. It's greater than any of you will ever live ever again. This is. <laughs> <laughs> Sad, but true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But good. I mean, people should spend their money. You can't well, buy a house in heaven, you know? Well, I like that, you know, these really important people have this faith in you. You have the most uh, expensive, luxurious cruise ship that's chosen you as the guy. Right now, you're in this show, Mad Apple, the Cirque du Soleil show at New York, New York, and you're the only stand-up yeah. on it. So, um, you know, I have moments like this, too, where... It, it, it's hard to beat yourself up and, and feel shitty and depressed when you're so blessed in life. Oh, then you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy. And I'm fortunate. I'm grateful that they've given me this opportunity to work with Cirque du Soleil, an iconic intellectual property and franchise. Um, and for some reason, in the middle of the show, I come up through a hole in the stage and I do my 10 minutes of comedy and I vanish down through the hole in the stage. It's a... Uh, That's awesome. Like Michael Jackson on that bad tour when yeah, we just come up from the... Much slower. I think they launched Michael. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I was hoping for that, but no, it's just sort of a uh, Punxsutawney Phil kind of <laughs> meandering. <laughs> he sees his shadow, so... Yeah. But the... Uh, Normal Cirque shows, having a comedian, that would obviously be incongruent. But in Mad Apple, the concept is it's a wild night where anything can happen. And so they throw all sorts of things at you, uh, stand-up comedy being one of them. Uh, it's not like in the middle of Copperfield. They'd be like, and now some archery. You know, it's, it's, it makes sense in this situation at Mad Apple, which is uh, I'm grateful for. And I'm, I'm, I'm having tons of fun. Well, you're... Um, you're... you're really well um, established in, in Las Vegas. And from my four or five trips to Hawaii, the thing I learned about Hawaiian people, other than their deep love of spam, um, Hawaiian people love Las Vegas. It's the and, ninth island. And like a lot of the uh, uh, Hawaiian people I talked to, the, the only trip they've ever taken to the United States was, or to the, you know, the lower 48 or whatever you guys call it, um, was to Vegas. The mainland. Why do Hawaiians love spam in Las Vegas so much? 
Well, because gambling is illegal in Hawaii. Yeah. It still exists, but not in the way that it does here in Las Vegas. So Hawaiians love to come up here and gamble their money away. And uh, uh, spam, like any, you know what? Anytime you have a, a poor food, it somehow becomes uh, a gourmet item decades in the future. Like oxtail was the worst part of the cow. Yeah. I mean, it hangs over the, the butt. Uh, yeah. And so poorer people started eating oxtail. And now it's a delicacy where you pay uh, 10 times more than you would for sirloin, let's say. Yeah. And that's what happened with spam. It, uh, during the war, they had a stockpile of these cans of uh, pork, I guess. I don't know what it is. But they, uh, it slowly became integrated into part of Hawaii's lifestyle. And now to the point where a spam mousse would be a little rice ball with a spam on it might run you five bucks yeah. for a slice of spam. It's incredible. Um, I, I heard that that's how French toast was also... Um, like a poor people's food, like the, uh, the the poor French people would get the older about to go stale bread, and in or in wartime when they yeah. uh, there wasn't much bread to go around, and right before the bread was going to go bad, they'd just flip it over in in mixed egg, and and then that was to preserve food for poor people. But who doesn't love French toast? Right, bread pudding, same thing. Uh, it's repurposed poor people's food that became uh, a, a delicacy, I guess. You know, I have a theory like about like oysters and uh, like foods that they had a hard time selling. Uh, the people came up with the idea that um, it would make your dick hard. Uh, it's an aphrodisiac, uh, like shark's fin. Like if you kill a shark, like what, what can you do with the fin? Ah, it makes your dick hard. So, uh, like, people that couldn't get rid of oysters. Well, that makes your dick hard. Right. So. Or balut in the Philippines. That's what they, they tell you. It's, uh, it's an aphrodisiac. When we were eating it on the street, they made me eat it on the street. Uh, and but, what is that exactly? That's... Balut is a duck egg uh, with a baby duck in it. Oh. Yeah. And so you pop the top off, and the, there's still feathers. And you, you suck it out of the egg. There's crunchy bits of beak and feather stuff in your mouth. It's horrible. But the hookers came by on the street and they were like, oh, that's an aphrodisiac. I'm like, oh, great. I, guess. I mean, because if you'll put that in your mouth, you put anything in your mouth, I guess. <laughs> now, you played all over Asia. And I remember one of my favorite Paul Agata jokes, you were talking about Malaysia or Singapore, that the punishment for uh, any having any kind of drugs is death. And you, the plane is about to land and you're dumping out your Advil going, I want to live, I want to live. <laughs> Something like that. They're very serious about that. <laughs> yeah. They will, and that's where the American kid got caught vandalizing and graffitiing. And yeah, they, and they spanked came, his ass with a stick. Caned him, yeah. Caned him till he was bleeding. Yeah, Bill Clinton was president and even tried to get them not to do it, I remember. And they still caned that kid anyway. Yeah. But, um, and they have the, in Singapore is the, uh, you know, if you throw chewing gum on the street, the penalty is caning. And yeah. if you've ever had a really nice expensive pair of shoes ruined by a piece of gum on a sidewalk, I uh, I can't say that's a bad punishment. Oh, I would line up to smack a butt. <laughs> Just, ugh. But, it, you know, to their credit, it seems like a very clean society. There's not a lot of littering yeah. and crime. It, so uh, violent threats followed through, I think, are effective. What, what What's the like strangest experience that happened to you from traveling in Asia? Ooh, I was in Tokyo to do a show in Roppongi, uh, and uh, I flew in a couple of nights before That's the, the show. bar area, yeah, right? Yeah, real uh, nightlife kind of spot of Tokyo. And uh, the other comedian, and I, he arranged the tour. We were in the bar the night before the show, just having a couple of beers, and there's a shadowy figure at the bar. You know, he's uh, covered in tattoos, and he's smoking up a storm, and he, he's overhearing that we're comedians from America. And he got on his phone a couple, like maybe 20 minutes later, uh, these other guys in suits show up with a, a guy clearly not uh, a criminal. Turns out he was the Yakuza's comedian. Oh, wow. And they want, this, they want to launch this guy into stardom. They, oh, so they brought him in to challenge us. Oh, 
a joke off. Yeah, not, and only one direction. Like he would try to make us laugh, and if we couldn't, if we laughed, uh, we'd have to do shots of tequila. Ah, and he tried his hardest. A big Japanese stereotype slapstick comedy where he'd pull off his shirt, slap his belly, he'd launch snot rockets out, uh, and shout incoherent stuff. Uh, and the other guy, Gary Jackson, he broke, so he had to drink many shots of tequila. But you know, I'm I'm down for my country. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't laugh not one time. And uh, he's probably dead now. They they probably murdered him because he was unsuccessful in his attempt. I think he was trying to get on the show. Oh, I see. Well, wow. yeah. and so maybe that was kind of his audition slash. Now those Japanese uh, gangster guys, the Yakuza, right? Uh, yeah. Um, the the loyalty thing when when they join is they have to cut off half of their pinky. I think it's maybe not a loyalty thing, but a sort of a punishment. If you oh. screw up somehow in your life as a criminal with this organization to prove your loyalty, then you've got to or your fealty or whatever it is, you take off a joint. You have to, yeah, well, a joint of your pinky. Yeah. Um, so I read about this like ten years ago or something about these former Yakuza gang members that are trying to re-enter Japanese society and get regular jobs. Um, there's all these um, uh, prosthetic little fake <laughs> pinky tips that they sell there. It's like big business in Japan is the fake uh, pinky tip. Yeah. I get it. And then they can do magic also. <laughs> gotta... the, the little rubber ball. <laughs> That's, wow, yeah. Uh, I've been on a, a Japanese movie um uh, kick lately. I mean, a, a lot of uh, so f Japanese culture is so fascinating. But uh, this Kurosawa movie called Stray Dog, okay, great film, nineteen forty one, and then uh, nineteen seventy one, Lady Snowblood, Lady Snowblood, yeah. And then I watch this movie Samurai Rebellion, and then I have this other one I haven't watched yet, Sword of Doom. I'm I'm obsessed with with samurai stuff. I think it's really cool. Oh, wow. And isn't it fun to see how Hollywood has cribbed a lot of that? Yeah. Well, Lady Snowblood is where Quentin Tarantino got the idea for Kill Bill with the, the, the sword fight in the snow. And it's this female assassin, and she's a badass. And when she slices people open, this, like, garden hose, this cartoonish amount of blood comes out of them, or, like, when she chops a head off. And so that's why in the Tarantino films, you'll see, like, the garden hose of cartoon blood come out of people. I love it. So I love it. If you can, it's an old TV series called Toyama no Kinsan, and it's about a local magistrate, a judge, who in the daytimes walks around town with his shirt off, and he's got tattoos, so people think he's a gangster, and he gets into all kinds of uh, troublesome situations, and he finds criminals who are later on dragged to court. And in court, he's in his kimono and his robe, and they don't know it's him. Until that, and they're lying like, I didn't do this crime, I didn't do that crime. And at, at the end of every episode, he whips off his kimono and he's like, oh yeah, I was there. And they're like, oh my God, it's the guy. <laughs> uh, to me, which is amazing, because that means that Asians even look alike to Asians. <laughs> but it's a good series. I mean, if you can find it, definitely watch that too. What do you think is the most Japanese thing about you? Because uh, you're so American. I mean, I think I'm more Japanese than you are, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll put money on that. A lot of times after shows, people will come out and speak Japanese to me, and I don't know what they're saying. I grew up uh, speaking English. My parents spoke English. I think my grandparents spoke Japanese, but I never heard them speak How many Japanese. generations back did your family come? Four, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm the fourth generation. Were any of your uh, family in the internment camps during World War II? No, but uh, an uncle of mine was in the 442nd in the... Uh, 100th Battalion, 442nd Infantry. That was the Japanese-American uh, unit that was sent to Europe to rescue uh, the white Americans who were in a dangerous situation. It was a suicide mission. Well, wow. And they sent them in there. A lot of them died. My uncle is still buried. He's buried in France, at Epinal, France, uh, on the battlefield. There. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. And, you, you, and I respect this about you because I'm from a military family. You are very really pro-military you've done like gigs uso gigs and military gigs for years and absolutely I, best shows I ever get you're like do. a very patriotic american uh well i mean i i'm grateful yeah i'm grateful for the sacrifices that uh the men and women who put on the uniform do for us and i'll gladly go wherever they are 
anywhere, wherever. Uh, I've done shows uh, in Afghanistan uh, it, while we were being shelled by the bad guys. We're in a bomb shelter and we're doing comedy for them. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, if it's a domestic base, I'll do that too. I, I don't care. It's, uh, it's my way of doing what I can, I guess. I uh, I respect that, but the um, USO military gigs I like to do are um, in Japan, and <laughs> Germany, and <laughs> places where we've where where we've already smoothed things out a bit. <laughs> we got bases everywhere. We're winning. We're winning, Tom. It's Stratego. We got. What is the most Hawaiian thing about you? Ah, uh, I think that I love carbs. In Hawaii, the diet consists largely of carbs. You've got. Two scoops of rice, a scoop of macaroni salad, whatever your meat is, covered in gravy, and they serve it with a giant fruit punch. It's probably like 5,000 calories for a plate lunch, and I'm, I'm down with that. I, I, I love that. I love in Hawaii, the, and it was the first time I ever had poke. Now you see poke is everywhere. It's, yeah, but it's, it's, it's the it's trendy food, but it's not good, right? But, it's fake poke. But, but the first time I had poke was like 20 years ago when I was in Hawaii, uh, doing a, a, a show and someone took me to the grocery store. And so I, I was just in Maui two months ago and, uh, and I went to, I went to go get that grocery store in the back of the grocery store is this little food land. That's it. Food land. Yeah. And there's like, you know, there's like six, seven different kinds of poke and yeah. And God bless you for pronouncing it correctly. Poke. It's yeah. It's not pokey. Uh, it's not spelled P O K I. It's P O K E. It's poke. Thank you for that. It's one of the best things on the planet. Oh, and in its purest, correct, simple form, it's just chopped up fish with some onions, maybe seaweed, a uh, little bit of sesame oil. Yeah. Some people put uh, crushed red pepper. Some people put little chunks of uh, uh, kukui nut. And, and that's great. You don't need uh, corn in it. Yeah. You don't need <laughs> yeah. edamame or any of this other tertiary nonsense. It should be uh, like you get in Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, you're making me hungry. I, lo I love it. That's uh, what a wonderful thing. Um, and do you envision yourself like uh, ever living back in Hawaii? Or I'd love to. Uh, obviously, it's, you know, one day maybe, but it's so expensive there. Um, when we lived in Hawaii, we bought a house for quarter mil and we sold it, doubled our money. But now for that same house, it's probably maybe a million dollars. Uh, and we're out of that game now. And to get back in, it'll it's kind of prohibitive, cost prohibitive. So if I do move back to Hawaii, I guess maybe it would be to somewhere on the Big Island, maybe in Kona. That's more affordable over there? Probably. Probably. Uh, definitely not on Oahu, that's for sure. Yeah. So... How did your comedy career start? I know I probably asked you this a long time ago. You started in Honolulu? Or you were on the radio or something, right? I started in college. There was a comedy competition on campus. Snuck away from the dorms. I didn't tell anybody. And I, I did okay. Tied for third. And that led me to doing spots at the local comedy club. Um, and I was horrible at it. In the beginning, I was terrible. And I stuck with it. I quit a couple of times. Uh, and then I heard that the... Local radio station, one of the local radio stations, fired their morning DJ. And I wrote a letter to the GM and I said, uh, I'm the kind of guy that likes to take advantage of other people's misfortunes. <laughs> so put me on your show. And he said, all right, uh, come on in. We'll try it out for a week. And that led to a couple of years at that one station. Then we launched another station. So about eight years of morning radio. Wow. And um, that must have been annoying, hearing all the bells and <laughs> ding, 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 ding. It wasn't like a morning zoo type of thing. We yeah. tried to make it different. Uh, and it was it was more uh, grown-up nonsense rather than juvenile. But is that how you started preparing material and writing? Yeah. It's such a good creative experience because you've got to write every day and then burn it down. You can't repeat that material the next day. Right. So I, I enjoyed that aspect of it, getting up at – Three in the morning, I didn't really like that. Because we're comedians. Yeah. Usually we don't stop vomiting till seven. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, that's, uh, and while I was doing radio, the Laugh Factory opened up in Waikiki. And uh, I played there. I sort of became the house MC, 
and the fill-in guy when uh, a comic did you, couldn't make it. Were you on that show that I did there? I think so. Yeah, I think you were. I think yeah. we talked about this before. Yeah. I think you were the MC, And that was like 20 years ago. Yeah. And the guy, um, what's his name? John, John Schneider. John Schneider. What a good man. Yeah. And he worked at the Laugh Factory in L.A., and so he opens this this laugh factory in Hawaii. Oh my God, laugh factory in Honolulu! And he invites me to do it. And I had just moved back from living in Amsterdam and all that. And I was I was back living in L.A. But I used to do the laugh factory in L.A. Uh, that was like one of my main clubs in when I lived in L.A. in the nineties. So sweet that he invited, but it, it was it was like it, it felt like it was like in kind of an arena. Ah, yeah. It was in his really large venue. His original location was at the Queen Kapiolani Hotel, uh, which itself was a, in a pretty big space. But uh, when he lost that space, he moved it over to the Blaisdell Arena uh, in one of the huge conference areas, which I, I think had the potential to seat maybe 600 people. Yeah, it was really large. Yeah. It was really large. And I think, you know, I think I had... 200 people there, you know, which was a decent draw. Yeah. But uh, in in a, a arena that holds 600 people, um, it, it, you know, it was, it, was, it was a great experience. And I had never, Waikiki is, I mean, that, that's like one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. And it's this public beach. It's iconic, yeah. And it's where surfing began with the Hawaiian royalty, right? And there's a huge bronze eight foot tall statue yeah. of duke kahanamoku right on waikiki beach and when they first erected that statue some prankster printed up like a, a bronze plaque and put it on the statue it said shown life size or shown actual size <laughs> and so for the and stood there for like for years they didn't realize that uh, this nonsense was on it and so people thought duke kahanamoku was an eight foot tall hawaiian guy <laughs> it's like it's it's life size and they finally found out and pulled it off. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a great club run by great club. And John Schneider people. was such a nice guy. And one of the things I wanted to say, it was really this family experience because his family helped him, you know, do the tickets and everything. And his his mother Ellie, his mother made deviled eggs. And one of my favorite things in life, other than poke and bacon and. Um, <laughs> stand-up comedy is is deviled eggs and they were amazing like the greatest devil so it was this beautiful backstage setup and then there's this big tray of deviled eggs and so you knew that you liked i was eggs. Yeah, so like I, aside from the show and the wonderful people and and um getting to hang out on waikiki all day is the my, my instant memory is backstage is going just like like I never like to eat too much before I go on stage so I can like move around. But I had like it was like Cool Hand Luke. I had <laughs> I, you, could, you could thump my belly like a watermelon. It was so full of deviled eggs. Yeah, they were, and I would have done it again too. If, he, if, if 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 his mom puts a plate of a hundred of those in front of me, I'm gonna eat every one of them. I, I wish I knew that. I would have said, "Oh yeah, I really like uh, A5 Wagyu Miyazaki ribeye," and I would have had a tray of that. <laughs> Uh, and you know what? When I was living in Hawaii, they were instrumental in getting Jamie Masada to put me on stage oh, wow. at the Hollywood Club. And they even, one night I show up and they uh, had my name on the marquee. And when you're first starting out, you're like, oh my God, that's a, that's yeah. a huge thing. Uh, I, so I, I, an eternal debt of gratitude to all the Schneiders. Yeah, God love him. God love him. So what's the game plan now? Just um, stocking up money from all this cruise ship? Yeah, yes. stacking my chips. How uh, many? How many of these cruises do you do a year? Wow, it um, quite a bit, I guess. Wouldn't it be great if some Hollywood executive could take one of these cruises and see you and go, "Oh my God, here's the most funniest undiscovered guy on the planet, uh, right next to Tom Rhodes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'd. Love Why don't that. these guys have homes in the Hollywood Hills? I would love that. Uh, I th who was it? We had some celebrities come on recently on the ship. Lionel Messi, the soccer. You're kidding. Uh, yeah, he was on the ship. He was on your ship? He Yeah, he launched the ship. He was the Wow. Man. He's the godfather of the ship. No kidding. Yeah. Um, he did the champagne on the, the yeah. bow breaking thing? 
Yeah, he. Yeah, you know, I didn't see it, but he probably kicked it because yeah. you know, on brand for soccer guys. Uh, there were some uh, right wing. Uh, ben Shapiro was on. Uh, he brought his kids to the adult show. What's his angle? Uh, I don't know. He's he's a right wing uh, pundit, as they say, commentator. I didn't really. I didn't meet him. I didn't get to know him. So I just knew he was on the ship. Uh, so he he went on and did a talk about trans people or something. <laughs> it, I, he was just there as a passenger. He wasn't. Oh there. oh oh. Okay. I thought because like a lot of times I have lectures on the. Oh yeah. I took one cruise in my life and the the. Uh, it was in the Mediterranean, and I really liked that there were lectures every day. Oh, like yeah. they had all these different experts. Like one guy talked about music, another person talked about, you know, the different architecture you could see on the thing. So I thought maybe the guy was he he was booked to do a lecture. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like at one p.m. we had <laughs> towel animals folding yeah. le- lessons, and then at two p.m. it's Ben Shapiro and why we should close the borders. <laughs> exactly, and keep the dirty rapists. Out. It's not, exactly, it wasn't so. like that. Uh, or maybe he was. I didn't. I didn't hear about it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm up and down. I'm. Open Did you see to- Lionel Messi? Uh, I didn't because he had a huge security team, oh. and I was allowed to see him. On a TV, on a closed circuit thing. Okay. That's uh, unfortunately. But, uh, you, you know, you meet a lot of people on these ships. Hall and Oates came on one time. Shaka Khan. Sarah, smile. Oh, my God. Did you see Hall and Oates are... Um, split up. They're split up and then... They're um, suing each other. Well, then uh, one got the restraining order against the other. I think Hall got a restraining order against Oates. That's probably... It sounds yeah. accurate that way. Yeah, so were they getting along then? I don't think that they were. You know, a lot of these famous duos, uh, whether in comedy or singing, never really got along. Well, as it turns out, Hall and Oates, I guess. Uh, Oates was playing <laughs> near my house at a shopping center last month. So, you know. I guess he's the one that had the order against him. He's the short yeah. one. Yes. Yeah. He's the one that didn't sing uh, a lot, it was always Daryl Hall. Yeah. Well, but it was, uh, well, that's sobering to one day you're top of the music world. Next day you're playing at Dos Lagos Shopping Center. In- was he, it was, so what, what was he, he was singing in, in the parking lot or? I didn't see it, but maybe it was in a parking lot. There's not a lot of places to sing at a shopping center. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if he would just be silent most of the time and then come in for his part of the song and just be quiet for 90% of, and just sing back up to nobody. I don't know what his, I wish I'd love to have seen it. He's a talented guy, probably. Right? He couldn't get a better gig than that. Well, I don't know. That's, let's not knock it. Uh, let's, let's be honest. I'll do a shopping center for John Oates money. Yeah. Uh, there was that old showbiz. There's a, a few old showbiz jokes. Um, uh, you could choose anyone. The first way I ever, I ever heard this was about, uh, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme, uh, knock knock. Who's there? Jean Claude Van Damme. Jean Claude Van Damme, who? At showbiz. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh. and then uh, there was there was one I used to do a long time ago. It was mean. I would have, I would pick someone, from, some like fallen rock star, or someone you didn't, you know. There was, uh, you know, now that I'm older in showbiz, like, you never hear me trashing anybody because there's so much ageism um but uh hey i saw um john oates the other day oh you did yeah um all right i saw him in uh in, in santa monica the other day oh what was he doing he was wrestling a pelican for a french fry <laughs> i don't think <laughs> i don't think things are going too well for him <laughs> so, oh, you're you're, man. you're a perfect straight man <laughs> See, we we could be, um, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, we couldn't hit it big because I don't hate you. It's not- <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> there was a great Spanish movie called um, "Laughing Yourself to Death," and I I saw it. I I saw it. I was in England, and there was some. I forget it was a Spanish filmmaker, but there was some little. It was a film festival that was doing a tribute to this guy. And, you know, I had the afternoon to kill and it, it was like the, the this independent theater was like a block away. And I just saw the title, Laughing Yourself to Death. And it was about a comedy team and they absolutely hated each other's guts. And it was like, 
like a, 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 a tall guy, tall skinny guy, and like a, a fat guy. And then they had started out as singers doing like an open mic night. And then something goes wrong and the, the tall skinny guy slaps the, the, the other guy. And then the audience laughs. <laughs> And so, like, the more he hits this guy, the the and then so the club owners going like, no, you, they get off. He's like, no, they love you. You got to go back. So they go back out, and the guy, the whole act, and then the the movie. These guys rise to fame, and they're on doing television and movies, and the whole act is the one guy smacking the shit out of the other, and everyone thinks it's hilarious, but they absolutely hate each other in real life, and they end up like they're living next to each other, and they just trying to kill each other. I like that. It's also kind of a cautionary tale to entertainers about the uh, feedback loop that we can fall victim to when the audience applauds at the at the wrong things. Yeah. And then we address that more. Uh, to the, and then we lose ourselves. And pretty soon you're getting smacked around by a fat guy. I mean, kind of, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but And I kind of feel that's what the crowd work trend is. A lot of comics are getting are posting crowd work clips online yeah that's the first thing i thought of when you said that that necess not necessarily should be doing that that a lot of these it's not for everybody yeah and i think uh, you see a lot of comedians now that are they're just trying to do crowd work so they can get that post they're not really working on material yeah you know and then um I think a lot of people will think, oh, that's what stand-up comedy is. You go there and then the guy on stage just like makes fun of everybody. A woman came up to me after a show uh, last month and said, I came to a comedy show looking for crowd work and thank you for delivering. And it is kind of a, a weird compliment because I'm glad she had a good time, but also why are you coming to a comedy show just to see crowd work? Right. It shouldn't be the only thing that you're hoping to see, but it was for her. It was the, it was the lure of seeing crowd work. I did it as a woman came up um, last night and said, oh, my God, you were so great. The, the, we were here last week and the comedians were horrible. And so and, it, and, and then two months ago, I did this casino uh, in Crescent City and people were like, oh, my God, you're amazing. The comedian last month, he was so wasted, he kept repeating the same jokes over and over. So, you know, thank God for... The comedians that make you look good by stinking up the place. Well, to be fair, anytime <laughs> Tom Rose rolls into town, the previous comedian pales in comparison. Yeah, eat it, punks. <laughs> so, um, you know, I want to know more about your, your your writing. Like, what like what are your what I what are what are you passionate about now? Because you don't talk about politics or anything like that. And on I'm, a show like uh, at Mad Apple, I don't really dwell on politics or if I'm on a cruise ship I can't do that because I'm trying to I'm trying to stay away from that kind of stuff completely because it doesn't last and I, I want to entertain the shit out of people that's true some some guy the other night goes do some politics jokes I'm like no. <laughs> why don't you fuck off you know <laughs> but the point is you could if you wanted to at a Tom Rhodes show people uh, are down with you let's all talk about the deaths that we've uh We've of people we've loved that, that we've endured. Uh, has anyone here? Were they? Any, you know, like why? Why talk about the shittiest things that have ever happened? You know, you. you know, I'm, like, I'm here to forget. I think you, you can. If wink a dink a dink a dink a dink a dink. You know, <laughs> that's such a comedy song too. I don't know what song that is, but it's <laughs> who wrote the wink a dink a dink a song. But you know, I'm here to forget and have a good time myself. You know. Yeah. And that's that's valid. But uh, if you wanted to address politics, you certainly could, because it's your crowd. They're coming to see you, and they know what you're about. They, uh, there, there would be no surprises. Whereas if I'm doing a show at Cirque du Soleil, Mad Apple, if I'm doing a show on a cruise ship, it's not my show. Yeah. So I can't. I'm not. I don't have that freedom or latitude to explore that. But. Certainly, if it's so, because it's at New York, New York. Do you like a fake New York accent? You, hey, you do your whole material, but like, <laughs> I like, do. But it's as like kind of a Brooklyn guy. Hey, right? So uh, I choose the Chinatown <laughs> borough to represent. No, uh, I don't. I just I do I do me, and uh, I guess and people don't care that uh, I don't have put on a fake New York accent. And I don't think it would read well if I did. What's your opening line? Uh, I say. Um, this is too much production value for me. 
I'm a comedian. I usually stand in front of a brick wall and tell dick jokes. But here I'm coming out of a hole like a groundhog. And if uh, the comedian sees his shadow, there's six more years of F1 construction. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thanks. But, and then, uh, then I can talk about whatever I want to talk about within reason. That's great. So um, w- what jokes have you written lately that you're the most proud of? Like what are the golden moments you've had? Wow. on crowd work or just concept ideas that you've had? Well, again, I've kind of been uh, hamstrung by the gigs I've taken where I'm not allowed to... You mean like the cruise ships and right. the Mad Apple? Yeah. Uh, there's. Uh, you can't do your salute to Rosa Parks and <laughs> the Stonewall Riots. You, might, you could, but it might be your last week <laughs> on the gig. Uh, and I used to film a lot of things, uh, crowd work situations on the shows. But uh, your honk about reproductive rights in Texas, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know that rich gold mine of comedy. I see like so many like young comedians that are angry and they're going out and like I, don't, I guess you know I, you know I used to want to make you know get my opinion out about a lot of things when I was younger, but you know to 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 go up and and make your act a political rally and like you know well newer comics forget or they don't know yet that you can have opinions but they have to be funny opinions yeah they think that it's all about being a firebrand when the successful firebrand comics are funny comics who are also opinionated yeah it's, uh they don't see that part they just want to emulate the the screaming and the shouting. There's a woman, I and I like her. I did a comedy festival with her years ago. I follow her on, on Instagram. And whenever she's on Instagram Live and I hit it, it's just like so much anger about... The, there's a few few comedians like that. And I'll hit their, their live and it's just, you know, what's, what pure venom is coming out today? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, doesn't the format kind of lend itself to angry screeds? Because... If it's an Instagram live, you're there alone in a room, ostensibly, speaking yeah. to nobody. So you have to fill I do a lot of hummingbird posts. Do, oh, see? Well, there you go. Because I, I got hummingbirds coming to my balcony. So, you know, maybe I should just, I should get a puppy and just, but then they'd grow. But it would just, me sitting there petting a puppy would be, I got some great hummingbird uh, footage. Do you feed them? Do you set out a... Uh... I've gone crazy. Have, have I not bored you with this? No, what? I've bored everyone on the planet with this. Um, so I've really become a hummingbird expert in the last um, few years, especially during the pandemic. Because I'm on the top floor of my building and there's these eucalyptus trees. And so they, the hummingbirds are attracted to the eucalyptus trees. So I started putting out, I have this one feeder. And then they come, but there's always one dominant hummingbird. Uh, who fights off the others. And like, especially during the lockdown of the pandemic, like there'd, there'd be one dominant one sitting up in the tree and it'd make a clicking noise. So I would Google, what does it mean when a hummingbird makes a clicking noise? It means they're dom- being dominant and territorial and protecting the food source of the nectar. And hummingbirds cannot differentiate the difference between a flower that has a limited amount of nectar versus a feeder that's full and and being refilled. So that's why, so about two or three months ago, um, I put up, I have a total of 10 large hummingbird feeders and then the little, the little, uh, the small ones that, uh, the suction, right. I got like six of those on the windows. Oh my God. And then five big ones hanging everywhere. So I've overwhelmed these hummingbirds with choice. And a beautiful thing has happened in the last month where they're starting to figure out that there's enough for everybody. And there'll still be one asshole dominant one that tries to chase the other ones away. But now, instead of getting one or two coming, um, I get like six or eight at a time. And then last week before I came here, the most beautiful thing happened. I had four hummingbirds feeding from the same feeder at the same time, and they weren't fighting. So it really, you know, gives all creatures on the the planet, uh, it it gives me hope that, you know, they would fight not knowing that there's enough for everybody. 
But now they're starting to figure out there's enough for everybody. And four hummingbirds feeding on the, the same feeder. And I, I got it. I filmed it. Did you start to click at the dominant bird? <laughs> That's what I should do. Yeah, totally. Uh, and scare him away so that the it opens it up for everyone else. I had to put up a screen on the door to my balcony uh, because once in a while, and it was, it was always the asshole dominant one that would get stuck in my apartment because <laughs> they're attracted to music. Are they? They're attracted to music. Uh, oh, they're hummingbirds, I guess, right? They don't, just don't know the words. That's why they. That's why they hum. They, yeah. they forgot the lyrics. They're coming in to read the uh, the liner notes on the <laughs> on the albums I leave out. Oh, Niall Rogers produced. So, oh. um, I have this. There's a above the door is this large window frame, and so they would get stuck up there and they hit the large window, and they they couldn't figure out how to get back down. Mm. So the first time it happened, um, I've learned you have to I have to wait until they tire themselves out and then they get lower. And then uh, I, could, I had this little like laundry bag that's like a net and I could th gently throw it over them. And the first time it happened, I threw the net over the dude and gently brought him down or her or they, who knows? What the, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't know. I don't know what the hummingbird gender world is like. Um, Trans alien. I, 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 so I threw him, threw him out, and then like the very next day, I'm. I always have my coffee on my balcony, and I'm standing on my balcony, and this hummingbird pops right up like a few feet in front of me, and just just looked me right in the face for like a full minute, because when I was trying to get him, it, it, it kept like you know, running away. And then I had to wait, you know, like it, it was like eight hours later until it got tired and then I could finally oh, wow. cap, catch him. And then the next day he pops up and it's like for a full, I'd say 30, 40 seconds, just sat there staring at me and then it buzzed off. And I know it was that same hummingbird that came back to tell me, you know, I had time to think about what happened. And I realized that you were trying to help me. Oh. Yeah. So it's really nice. Birds are smarter than we think. Crows will recognize an individual's face. And uh, humming, uh, apparently hummingbirds as well. Yeah. it's uh, And crows um, can use tools too. Yes. They'll bring you gifts. I don't know if hum they'll, they'll find a shiny object. And bring it to you. Yeah. Buttons yeah. Or, or whatever it is in exchange for, for food, I guess. Because so. they like you. Did you see Beef? The Netflix show with Ali oh, Wong? Yes. Yeah, I did. There's a really cool, I think it's one of the most brilliant, it's about anger. And uh, I think it's one of the most brilliant um, uh, television shows ever made. And then like on the, the, it was like 10 episodes and then like on the ninth or 10 episode, there's an element about the crows and how they recognize people. I thought that was really ingenious. That, well, and also, and, that was a good TV show, TV series, uh, and I'm glad it won awards. But, uh, you know, we're on the cusp of the Oscars, and uh, I, I'd like to see more Asian representation also in film. Well, Beef was, well, I guess television. So yeah, it was a good, it, and it won awards, like they won the SAG Awards. Where is cinema, modern cinema failing Asian people? Like, it, will, you, will there be, uh, like, the, you know, uh, like, a, it, it, will there be a Black Panther for Asian people? I'd like to see that. The stories exist uh, in other formats, whether it's uh, manga or uh, television series, and it could easily be translatable to the big screen. Uh, just you have to give the storytellers a chance. And I, I'd like to see more of that, you know. Uh, and also Asian American or Asian actors. There was a movie called Ghost in the Machine where... Uh, in its original source. Oh, and then they had all white actors and yeah, stuff. The yeah, the main character was a Japanese woman. But on the movie version, Scarlett Johansson played this Oh, character. right, yeah. Uh, and no, not against Scarlett. She's a great actress, but how about we tell the story? Yeah, well. Um, I'm a big baseball fan, and I'm really excited about the Dodgers. Yeah. Get Notani, and then they brought in the, the I don't know the guy's name, The he was the number one pitcher in the Japanese league. Right. Uh, the guy who cuts my hair uh, is from Japan. 
Wow. And he's a huge baseball fan. And uh, my team for the Japan is the Hanshin Tigers, and he's also a Hanshin Tigers f- fan. So, you know, he texted me when uh, he was, he's how I found out the Dodgers got Otani and then this, this other pitcher. And um, he and I went to Dodger Stadium a few years ago for the, uh, it was, it was Japanese Appreciation Night. Oh, they had good uh, swag, right? They, yeah, they have- I have it. It'd be great. It's it's a Dodger hat. Instead of it being blue with, with the white letters, it's blue with kind of a pink reddish letters. And there's a floral thing under the bill. And then it's got the flag of Japan on the side. I've got one. It's it's absolutely beautiful. Oh, I wanted to go to that game and get that hat. It, That's, was, it was worth it. Because you had to pay extra money. I would have gladly. Get, and it, 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 I'm glad I did. So, oh, you're so fortunate. Yeah. So are you a baseball fan? Uh, I would rather watch uh, football or MMA or basketball. Baseball is sort of my... Uh, if I'm at the park, I'll go every chance I can. But on yeah. TV... Uh, yeah, I mean, I could watch little kids play Little League. That's how much I like it. Yeah. Um, but uh, and I, I like soccer and I like bo- traditional boxing. Mm-hmm. MMA, I find too savage. Yeah. Did I ever tell you the, the, the joke I wrote about... Uh, UFC? No. Um, it's always There's always this one moment in UFC where a fighter gets knocked down and the other fighter gets on top of him with his knees on either side of his, his ears and like his dick is in his face and he's punching him in the face. And he's like, ha ha, my dick is in your face and I'm punching you in the face. I remember the first time I saw that, I thought, are these the deleted scenes from Shawshank Redemption? <laughs> 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 so, so, you, so you like that? Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You're really into dick in the I face boxing. Seen Shawshank Redemption my whole life until maybe three years ago. So uh, that's extra funny. I want to, oh, okay. I, I, I still want to go to Zay Watanejo. That's where he was trying to get to. With the boat on the beach? Yeah. Yeah. You are so obtuse. Stop being what, th- that's the word he he told the guy. And you know the guy didn't understand him. It was, um, uh, but you know what MMA is, if sport is a substitute for combat, then MMA is the pure sport. Just to see, it's the ultimate uh, test of person versus person. Well, I mean, that's what I feel about boxing. I, I love, I like traditional boxing. And I've been on TikTok, and I don't know how TikTok knows what I'm into, but TikTok, should, when I go on TikTok, it shows me classic old boxing, and I love it. I flipped on there the other day. I don't go on there very often. I try to just post and ghost to not, um, you know, I've given up weed. I'm trying to give up social media, uh, but I, you know, um, you know, because I think everyone's addicted to the likes, but, sure. uh, and I don't post very much on TikTok, but... When I go on there and I flip it on, like I flip, there was like uh, Hearns and Hagler the other day, and then uh, that was like a week ago, and then two days ago I clipped on there and it was Roberto Duran and uh, Thomas Hearns, and those eighties eighties boxing was like the most exciting period of boxing, I think. It was where Sugar Ray would be, yeah, doing Pizza Hut commercials. Those were it was good times, man. Good times, but the the algorithm shows you what you watch you know so you i've never looked up never looked up boxing on my phone but it maybe knows that you've uh, had eyeballs on a boxing video at some point okay or documentaries and things like that that's a cookie that exists okay and tiktok or facebook will access your cookies and like oh tom rose likes boxing and deviled eggs or whatever yeah. it is. And it'll show you box. There's not a lot of deviled egg videos. <laughs> but- be, that's me in the future eating deviled eggs, watching classic boxing. That's Give me the uppercut. <laughs> nom, 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 nom. <laughs> so it shows, it knows, dude. I mean, it, yeah. our life choices exist in the cloud, in the ether. And bad actors sometimes will harvest these uh, bits of data. Mm. And it'll manifest usually in the form of you seeing a, a video that you like. But so is that why when I, when I go on the search um, bar on Instagram, I get uh, a big ass? <laughs> 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 
You can't hide, there's a, dude. There's it a knows. lot of women with big asses on there. Yes. <laughs> You're like Sir Mix a lot. So, somebody somewhere knows that uh, I can care less about titties, that I'm an ass man. Yeah. Okay. You like big butts and you cannot lie. <laughs> they know. That's great. Well, um, any other thoughts you want to share? What's um, what's the game plan now? I have so much respect and love for you, Paul. I just, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, you know, uh, you're one of my favorite comedians. We haven't, I haven't got to see you work in a long time, which is a shame. Yeah, well, that's the, our, the nature of what we do, right? Uh, the guys and, and gals that you appreciate, you go in different ways, and you're headlining in one town, somebody's headlining in another city, and yeah, you, you rarely get to see each other. But I'm thankful for a place like Vegas, which is like a, uh, 365 day a year comedy festival where I get to run yeah, into that's a great way to put it. friends like you. Yeah, that's great. You're uh, you're you're headlining adjacent to here at the New York, New York. Yeah, and I'm at the Tropicana for the last time. Wow i I was able to do a, a week here in November uh, as my sort of final farewell. Nice, but uh, you man, you got it right in under the wire. Yeah, and as sad as I want to be about it, you know, like my father loved Vegas and he always wanted me to play Vegas. Um, and when I was younger, I wanted nothing to do with Vegas, you know, because, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't the best comedians that played here. You know, times have changed. But the one and only time my father got to see me perform in Vegas was in this room. Oh, wow. Uh, when it was the I, at the very tail end of... Comedy stop at the Trop. Oh, Cap uh, Arts. Yeah, um, I did it. But I'm trying to remind myself, like this magnificent view is the you know last time I'll get to enjoy this because it'll be a baseball stadium soon. Yeah. And then I the, the, the I think this will be the outfield because the design is going to be the the outfield looking at the skyline. So the, all the seats will be way over there. So uh, I saw a picture, uh, an artist rendering, and it kind of looks like the Sydney Opera that's House. That's exactly what I thought. It looks like the Sydney Opera House. It's beautiful. Which is gorgeous. Yeah. Um, but so the when I want to feel melancholy about this going away, because the Laugh Factory is just going to move to another great location, uh, I try and remind myself of what someone told me about uh, what I should think of in regard to my last relationship. What is coming is better than what is gone. And that's what people say when they see Tom Rhodes on the calendar at any comedy club. What's coming is better than what You're we You're so had much last. better than the people here that were here last week, <laughs> <laughs> last month. Okay, Paulo Gata, I love you very much, my brother. Love you too. And uh, long may you run, brother. Yeah, hopefully um, uh, the good Lord in the heavens will... Uh, Lift us up and we can make, we can do arena tours together. Yeah. And at the very least, let's do another Jakarta festival. Yeah, man. I'm in. All right. I'm in. Let's, uh, I'll email uh, Eamon now. Sounds good. All right, brother. Long may you run.